Welcome to episode 23 of the Ikario podcast. Today we are talking about a topic that was suggested by one of the Ikario community members and it is on the topic of the courage to be disliked. So if you have ever struggled with essentially being afraid of of rustling other people's feathers, if you're kind of always trying to make sure that everybody likes you, nobody disagrees with you, that is a problem that many people suffer from. And needless to say, it's probably holding you back from really achieving your full potential. So that's what we are talking about today. This topic is really quite a deep well, and we're grateful to Chris, the community member who suggested this topic. It turned into a really interesting conversation, and I hope you'll find it useful and enlightening. Before we get into that, let me just quickly say a few words about what else is going on at Ikario. So right now, we are in the final part of a Focus and Action live class. So that is the live class. It's a nine-week class that we do that is all about high-level productivity skills. And that class has been going extremely well. We're about to wrap that up. We are also in the middle of a challenge that we're doing with over 200 people. That is the 21 Days to Crush Procrastination Challenge. And now both of these are currently closed. So if you missed the boat on both of these right now, you can't join because they're ongoing. But the 21 Days to Crush Procrastination Challenge is going to become open again sometime soon. We are also very likely going to do another run of the Focus and Action Live class. And I'm mentioning this because I want to say two things about it. The first is that through these classes and through the Ikario community, we are starting to build a really cool community. It's it's going very well and I'm really glad to see how many like growth-minded, ambitious, interesting people are finding this community and joining us on these various challenges and classes. And if you would like to take part in this kind of thing at some point in the future, and if you wanna make sure that you don't miss out the next time we open a new challenge or we reopen one of our live classes, if you just go to the homepage, the ikari.com homepage, you can find links there that will lead you to some of our free mini courses where you can sign up. And that will also put you on our notification list for future products and challenges. And like I said, these things are going great. Our students are getting amazing results. We're building an awesome community. So I just wanted to mention that here in case you've been listening to the podcast and you're not aware of what we're doing over on the Ikario website, I highly recommend that you give it a visit and sign up. With that said, show notes and anything specific to today's episode is also on the website at ikario.com forward slash 023 for episode 23. And with that, Let's start today's episode. Welcome to the Ikario podcast, where we help you break free from the human zoo, optimize your life, and become a force to be reckoned with. Hello, once again, with your hosts, uh, Ollie. <laughs> almost got <laughs> almost forgot your name. Almost forgot my name okay. then. <laughs> Ollie. <laughs> and uh, and here Shane. He is. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Our intros are still like just so polished. It's unbelievable. We just press record other, and start talking and whatever. <laughs> other other podcasts are envious of our intros. <laughs> anyway, today is the first uh, member suggested episode. So we have um, we haven't really talked about this. We'll we'll talk about this in more detail at some point. But the basic idea is, as you probably noticed, there is no ads or sponsors or anything in these episodes, and our goal is to be completely listener funded. And we have, to this end, we have the Ikario community. Uh, you can learn more about that by going to ikario.com forward slash join. And basically, uh, it's kind of like a Patreon type thing. You know, if you like what we do, you want to support what we do, you can give us a couple of bucks a month and you get a couple of perks. And it allows us to keep doing this. And one of the perks is that members can obviously hang out in our community forum, but also can suggest and vote on podcast topics. And the current highest voted one is from Chris. So I'll read this out. This is what Chris posted. This is a quote from a book called The Courage to be Disliked. I thought it could make for an interesting discussion on the podcast. Freedom is being disliked by other people. It is proof that you are exercising your freedom and living in freedom and a sign that you are living in accordance with your own principles. Conducting yourself in such a way as to not be disliked by anyone is an extremely unfree way of living. 
Boom. That's a great quote. Yeah, it's a great, a great quote. quote from a great book. Mm-hmm. I've read that book myself and it's... Oh, okay. I haven't read it. So. It's one of the best books I've read. As in, and I'm assessing that based on the effect it had on my life at mm. the time. If you are a person who, which who I was, your self-worth comes a lot from the reactions, the positive reactions of other people. This is like a, a book that will just reach through the page and punch you in the nose. <laughs> um, but that quote reminds me as well of uh, the, the idea that if you have no, I mean, it might be a bit radical, but if you have no enemies, um, you're not being truthful. Mm. And I kind of get the sentiment, although enemies might be a bit strong, as I said. But the idea is that if you're like, if you're just vanilla, it's like you're not pissing anyone off, but it's also possible that you're not really deeply resonating with people either. For sure. You're just yeah. existing in this this safe middle ground where you're not te- you're not stepping on anyone's toes, but no one really knows you either. Yeah, a hundred percent. I can I can attest to that from personal experience. So, and we can definitely talk about that. So, basically, there's two things I want to I want to talk about here. One is this the idea of, of freedom um, that I briefly want to touch on because I think it makes a really interesting point about freedom. And then I want to talk about the courage to be disliked, not the not the book, but like the the. <laughs> the trait of being courageous enough to be disliked because I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with a lot and it is indeed something that limits your freedom and your life quality severely. So I definitely want to get into this and I'm really interested to hear your take on this as well Uh, because, yeah, I have a a set of experiences with this that I'm happy to share but I think is probably not very representative or, you know, maybe we'll find out. I don't know how many people resonate with this but... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to hear as well what your, you know, I've heard parts of your story with this, but I think it's something that will be interesting to dive deeper into. So, yeah, the first thing I would quickly want to touch on is this idea of of freedom and where it basically says, yeah, freedom is being disliked by other people and arguably like being comfortable, being okay with that, right? Being disliked by other people and not feeling like immediately this is something I need to fix. And There's an interesting principle here where I think the way we imagine freedom is often not quite accurate in terms of what real freedom is like. So when you think of freedom, actually, I invite you to like briefly think about, you know, what represents that? What is what is what does freedom look and feel like? Well, one thing I can say is if you type in freedom on Google image search, you will be confronted with countless images of people in suits on top on tops of mountains with their hands in the <laughs> air. Yeah, spreading their arms <laughs> out. Spreading their arms out like this. <laughs> yeah. It was like, why are you in a suit? That is not <laughs> adequate hiking gear. <laughs> you you madman. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's actually a good that's a good point. Um, if you look at you could <laughs> in a way, the Google image search almost represents like the collective unconscious or something right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we'll we'll maybe we'll put an overlay here of the actual google image search right <laughs> of the results but my guess is that you'll probably have a lot of like beaches maybe exotic beaches yeah people on people spreading their arms out on mountaintops uh, vast landscapes yep. people facing vast landscapes that kind of thing right that's freedom and yeah it's interesting that also if you think about so you you basically want to be in a certain state, right? If only I was, whatever, jumping for joy on top of a mountain in a vast landscape, that would feel free. If or I was I was chilling on a beach, instead of having to work and things like that, that would be freedom. Or perhaps just if I had lots of money, that would be freedom. And yes, those things can give you freedom or a sense of freedom. But I think importantly, there's also a lot of freedom in not needing those things. Hmm. And that's that's the thing that I think we often miss because, or in a way, there's more authentic and deeper freedom in not needing something. Because as long as you as long as you make your make your sense of freedom contingent on being on that mountaintop or on the beach and and having things, then you're always chasing after that. And once you achieve it, you're you now have to guard it somehow, so that your freedom isn't taken away from you, right? So in a sense, it impedes your freedom. <laughs> yes. Because yeah. you, even if you got the thing, 
now you have to de- protect against it and now you you have another problem mm-hmm. which is oh my god what if it goes away exactly because exactly. you in your mind you really need this thing mm-hmm. and there's a quote that you actually mentioned i think it was on another podcast episode just simply uh, not needing the thing is, is as, as good, good as, having, as, it, as yeah. having it yeah and i've uh, yeah and i've often thought about that and i agree <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> And this is also, we actually have, oh, look, second plug for the for the membership. <laughs> we have another clip. We have a clip that is member exclusive where we talk about this a bit as well, where, yeah, I think, and, and you know, I'm not saying that, I don't think it's useful to think of this in a black and white sense because, of course, you can say that, oh, if you pursue money, because of the freedom that can give you, then all you, you're just a captive of the system and you're a captive of the money and then you're neurotic about losing your money and so on. So true freedom is having nothing, you know, living in a box and just like meditating and needing nothing. And I think that actually, if you want to argue that, I think there's some truth to that. I think in a, in a spiritual th- sense, th- it's probably true that if you can be fully content you know, sitting in a in a carpet box under a bridge in the freezing cold, and just you're just content because you need nothing. That is probably a state of greater freedom than if you have if you're your typical millionaire. You know, mm, that was the stoic kind of vibe, wasn't mm-hmm. it? The all these mad stoics back in the day, and I say back in the day as if it's like <laughs> the golden era of my life, like back <laughs> yeah. in the back in the Remember stoic that? time, the good old days <laughs> in stoicism in ancient Greece. Um, but these guys were just these lunatics would just be. <laughs> Trying to out stoic each other, like just <laughs> getting rid of shit that they thought they needed. Who was the guy? Was it Democritus who, who walked around in a barrel or something? Who was it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there was another guy that just walked around in rags that had not washed in ages with a cup for water. And then he just saw loads of kids drinking water from the well with their hands. He's like, right, I don't need this shit anymore. And threw the cup out <laughs> as if the cup was the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> The arms race of stoicism. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So I would say that, but yeah, the argument, that's not the argument I'm trying to make. Mm. In fact, I think that the the greatest power lies in in basically having things and not needing them, right? Rather than not having them and not needing them. The greatest power lies in having things and not needing them. So, and an example I gave for this is um, you know, one of the things that, so for, for most of my life, I've lived very frugally, but there are certain things that basically as my income has gone up, I spent more and more money on certain things, including camera gear, for example, and including headphones of which I have a really ridiculous amount at this point. <laughs> and you can't see on camera <laughs> yeah, right now, a lot but of headphones in like, this row. It's like four pairs. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and we're wearing <laughs> some. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought a pair over as well. Yeah, so There's it's just so many All together, too room. many headphones in this room. But, <laughs> but here's the thing, right? So, but th- and that's the thing. Like, okay, I, I work with cameras, obviously, and I enjoy working with cameras. And there's some <laughs> benefit to getting a new piece of camera gear, right? There's some benefit to that, but it's very limited. At some point... You know, right now, I could probably not buy another camera thing for the next 10 years and I'd be fine. And you probably wouldn't even notice in my videos, right? But the reality is over the next 10 years, we're probably going to be spending lots of money on new lenses and new stuff. And in and if you watch our videos, you probably can't tell, right? I'll have spent money on a new camera and you watch that video and there's no difference. You're none the wiser. <laughs> Can you tell now we're filming this bad boy on a different <laughs> camera than that's usual? True. <laughs> that's true. But no one noticed. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so point <laughs> point proven probably, right? So, but the point is, so the point I want to make with all this is that yes, I gained because of, um, because of my increasing income, basically, I gained the freedom to, to buy more stuff. And I have bought more stuff. But I think that the important thing is that I, the entire time I'm aware that I don't need this stuff. I don't tell myself that, oh, I really need, oh, I really need this new camera because it has, you know, 10 bit 422 color instead of 8 bit 420. And it's like it makes That's a difference. That's very important. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to try and justify this expense, instead, the way I see it is like, look, this is a toy. This is a, a, a cool toy that I want to play with. And I'm going to geek out about, oh, look how you can color grade this and so on. And nobody else is going to notice. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. This is just something I enjoy. And it's the same with, with headphones, right? I happen to 
really enjoy just listening to music and I love putting on a new pair of headphones and hearing just how, how it's slightly different and how I hear slightly different details in the music and so on. Listen, I went for years and years and years with just like one pair of headphones and was perfectly happy with that. And I know that if something happened in my life where it's like, oh, I have to sell all my headphones, I'd be perfectly fine, right? In fact, with things like that, I wouldn't even be sad about that, I think, you know? It's, it's not even, if I somehow got into a situation where it's like, okay, you have to sell 90% of your camera gear and all but one of your headphones. Okay, fine, right? Sure. The, it's, and this is, this is what I mean by having the things and not needing them at the same time, right? I'm not attached to these things. I can enjoy them. And especially when it comes to headphones, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. I really do. You know, to me, it feels like money well spent if I'm sitting there just blissed out by how good the music sounds. It seems like a really worthwhile thing to spend money on, you know. But at the same time, I'm not attached to that. I'm perfectly fine living without that again. Well, also, one other thing I'd say about that is I would argue that the fact that you don't need it gives you access to a dimension of enjoyment of the activity that you wouldn't have otherwise. So if you were listening to a bunch of, using, you know, using a bunch of different headphones, and maybe, maybe it's not a great example for this, but if you had something and in the back of your mind, you're like, I need this thing, mm. then a need, it's like there's a, there's a slightly graspy element to it. Whereas yeah. if, you're, if you can safely say, I don't need this, but here it is, it's like you can enjoy the thing, you can play with it, you can appreciate it, but there isn't that compulsive quality to, like that. There, there isn't that thought in the background, I need this to stay, mm. I need this to be like this, or I need this to, to stay a constant. So, yeah. So there's not as grasping. Yeah, in fact, I think I can, I can give a specific example of how that's true, which is that when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to things like headphones or camera gear and so on, of course I treat everything I have with care, because I think that's the right thing to do. And I'd rather have it last longer than not. But like the reality is it's not going to last forever. And even, you know, it gets dinged up every once in a while. You take the camera gear out on a shoot or something, you know, maybe it gets a few scratches. Your headphones, you know, the stuff wears out and stains and so on. And I, I don't worry about that, you know. And I think that is something that if you're too attached to it, you can become neurotic about that. It's like, Ooh, oh, no, it's not pristine anymore. And, oh... You know, and what it, if it's like you see it deteriorating, it's like, oh, my God, I'm losing the thing. Whereas for me, it's like, well, that's just what happens when you using, use things. You know, I don't expect it to be in pristine condition several years from now. Yeah. And so I think that's a way in which it's it removes a level of like worry and neurosis that I would have if I was more attached to this stuff. Makes sense. So to relate this back to being yeah disliked by people or being liked by people yeah and and being disliked by people as being a, a state of freedom so what we're essentially saying here is what if you could summarize well, it it's i think the same thing very much applies of course it is there's a there's freedom in not needing the approval of other people but the ideal state you want to be in is you want to have the approval of some people but not need it, not desperately need it, and not um, not be thrown in a, into a loop every time someone doesn't approve, right? But again, it's basically the same thing. You could be, you could just retreat and just be by yourself and not care about anyone, and essentially, and basically, this is the freedom of not needing anyone. I can relate this to my own experience as well because I actually lived in a state of not needing anyone and not having anyone for quite a long time. Um, when I first moved away from Switzerland, where I grew up, I moved to Romania. That was my first first stop as a digital nomad, basically. And I lived there for the first four or five months or something. I basically was just isolated. I barely spoke. I basically spoke to no one except like saying thank you to the cashier, you know, when I bought groceries. And I was just... It, there in a country I'd never been to, in a city that where I knew no one, and I was just mostly sitting at home and, and working. And sometimes I'd ride my bicycle and I'd go to the gym, but I basically didn't interact with any human beings for, yeah, a pretty long time. And I was perfectly comfortable with that. I was really feeling very comfortable with that. And that's, you know, I'm, 
I'm an introvert, I'm a loner, so I'm quite... So I was in that state of, I don't need anyone and I clearly don't need anyone, otherwise we've been freaking out, right? <laughs> <laughs> we've been torture. Um, and, but I also don't have anyone. And, and obviously that also goes to like, look, I don't have anyone's approval. I don't have anyone's disapproval. I'm just like disconnected. And that's perfectly fine. But, you know, in my life, I have chosen to build social connections. I've chosen to build a tribe around myself because, and I, I still not, I'm not desperately hungry for everyone's approval all the time. I still don't need that, mm -hmm. but I still, I want to have people around me and I want to have social interactions. And that includes some potential tensions and things like that. But I, I choose to create that for myself, not out of, not because I need it to exist or need it to be comfortable, but because I want it. Yeah, I can so, relate to that. I, I can, because uh, I can relate to that in the sense that when I lived in my own flat, like lived alone for about a year, there was just something so, for me, just so safe and tidy about it, you mm -hmm. know? It's like I just, whatever happens, I just come back to the flat and there's no messiness. Mm -hmm. I think it's like the messiness of relationships and, you know, connections and stuff that I was always shying away from. But I can relate. I was surprisingly, yeah. I was surprisingly okay with that. Mm. So having said that, let's let's talk a bit about the courage to be disliked and because okay what I, what I see a lot of people suffer from this where they're very concerned with how they're perceived by other people and they it is something that really limits their freedom and lowers their life quality that they spend so much time worrying about what do other people think of me and also having really strong reactions to whenever it seems like maybe someone disapproves of me or someone doesn't like me that's like a huge deal it's a huge problem and obviously that is something you know that makes your life less enjoyable if you're just constantly worried about this and constantly yeah have sleepless nights because someone doesn't like you and stuff like that right yeah that's obviously a problem i think everybody can perceive that as a problem but of course it's easier said than done so okay yeah you, you have the courage to be disliked don't worry about it. don't try to approve it don't try to get everyone's approval. It's easier said than done. So what practical advice can we give someone who struggles with this, right? Someone who can basically, who agrees with what we've said so far, says, yeah, that sounds great. I'd like to have that freedom. But how? It's like, it's not a, like I'm choosing to be neurotic about this, right? It's not like I'm choosing to care. Where, where do you start if you have this problem? Great, yeah. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. So for me, I think it's, there's something to be said for cultivating a sense of self-worth that doesn't depend upon that. So if I, if I want everyone to like me, that's basically, that's me creating a condition for my self-worth that's in other people's hands. And because it's not in my control, I get anxious about it because it's like you're trying to predict things that you don't have control over. You have absolutely no control over whether people like you or not. Mm. You know, you can influence things. You can become likable as a person and stuff, but ultimately it's in their... It's still up to them. Yeah. It's in their ballpark. The problem there is that you, you, you're taking the, that... The locus of your self-worth is in other people's hands. So it's like, how do you reclaim that? And it can be... It can be in asking yourself what it is that you want to create in your own life, the kind of person you want to become, and stepping onto the path of doing that for the for the long term. This is not a problem that solves quickly. Mm -hmm. If a person's life script is, I need other people to like me, then one, that formed at some point, and two, that probably has been reinforced over time. Yeah. So it's not something that you're just going to resolve quickly. So that's the one thing is like reclaiming your source of self-worth. So it's not in the hands of other people. It's mostly in your control. And the second thing I'd say is, you're going to love this, introspective writing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> introspective writing comes up once again because yeah. it really is that powerful. Asking yourself about times in your life where this script may have formed. Mm-hmm where you 
maybe didn't get the approval of people in such a painful way that that left a mark and that's not been healed yet. So mm -hmm. now you're, you're unconsciously replaying an old script where it's like, I didn't get approval in such a dramatic way at this point, and that was so painful. I, je I do not want that to happen again. Mm -hmm. And you can start questioning that story that you learned then and, and see if that's still true. That's one of the, it's kind of a, a gentle inquiry that you can do in writing. You can, if you think about, oh, here's, here are situations in my past where this was true where, or where my need for other people's approval is that helped me in some way to survive or to feel safe or something like that. But then you can ask yourself, well, okay, I have since then I've grown up and my life circumstances have changed. Like, are these stories still true? And this too, you know, it's probably not going to resolve in a single session, but it can start like prodding at that, right? If you have like this old calcified story that's keeping you stuck, this kind of inquiry and writing about it can start like softening that a little bit and it can be the beginning of change. Yeah. And another thing that, you know, one thing that comes to mind is like, if you desperately seek the approval of others and you want other people to like you, I think an important question is, well, do you like you? <laughs> because I think that the more you have kind of a, the more you have like a rock solid center in yourself, the less easily you are shaken by other people's response. Mm. And and the question of do you like you is important because if I, and this is also something that personally I developed through writing about it, to get a sense of, well, what do I think is important? What are important values um, for a person? What makes a person a good person? And I become clear about, about my beliefs around this. And then I can think about how do I relate to this? What do I look like here? And so there are qualities about myself that I like and that are not subjective. Right? There, there are things that I, that I do. There are things that I, um, the way I am as a person, some things about that are things that I have a, I like these things about me and I have strong reasons for liking them, right? So I believe that I have a, yeah, I have a basically, it goes relatively deep. It's not just a sh an emotional surface level response. Oh, I like this. I don't like this. It is rooted to my sense of, of values and virtue. And here's why this, why this matters. At this point, if someone dislikes me, it becomes more like a disagreement where we can discuss that rather than this kind of value judgment. So if I don't have this, right, if I contrast that, if, if I haven't done this work and I don't have like this core of beliefs about what makes a good person and this strong idea of what do I like about myself and someone comes into my life and they don't like me, then that's, that's like the only signal I get is Shane is not good. Oh my God, that's a disaster. How do I fix this? But same situation, if I have this core, I know what my values are, I feel like I'm aligned with my values, and someone says, Shane is a bad person. My response is like, well, that's odd that you would think that. Let's discuss, you know? Yeah. And it's it's a bit like, it's a bit like, you know, I don't know, if, if someone, think about any topic that I know something about, you know? Let's say if I if I know nothing about nutrition, someone comes in and says, you know what? Butter is really healthy. You should eat more butter. I go, oh, okay. Well, is the person wearing a lab coat? Oh, they're wearing a lab coat. Okay, maybe I should eat more butter, right? Because wh what do I have to compare it to? I don't know anything. But if I have, like the deeper my knowledge of nutrition and biology goes, the more I won't, I won't just take that on. If someone comes and says, you should eat more butter because it's healthy, I go, hold on. How does that work? Can you explain to me like the biological pathway by which butter consumption leads to a positive health outcome and also what health outcomes are we talking about mm -hmm. so it doesn't immediately it like doesn't immediately get downloaded and installed you know it's more like well that's curious <laughs> you know <laughs> and so that is something that i think can happen as you build a stronger core of of who you are what your values are and you live in line with those values you become less vulnerable to these external uh, these external signals and the other thing actually 
is to is to practice this is i think the most practical thing we can maybe talk about here is to to practice having healthy disagreements hmm because and this is look this is a pet theory of mine i don't know if this is true but um and maybe you know maybe listeners can can tell us if they're if they've observed this or not i can imagine that there is a, a strong overlap between people who um who have a great need for other people's approval and people who avoid and dislike uh, disagreements. I think there's probably big overlap there, right, on the Venn diagram. Hmm. Same people. Because I think that's one of the things where if you if you if you dislike disagreements and you feel like that's something to be avoided at all times, and you don't have an experience of having a healthy disagreement with someone where it's like, here's my opinion, here's your opinion, here's my ideas, your ideas. And maybe we end up not agreeing. Maybe we find some compromise. Maybe you change your mind or vice versa. If you have that experience, it, it also changes your relationship to other people's opinions and feelings and things, you know, because hmm. you feel like, well, yes, you have your opinions and, and your beliefs and so on. And I have mine. And there is a way for those to meet. And there are places where we might end up agreeing and places where we don't. But it's like malleable. And it's like it's it's more of a maybe, you know, it's more of a maybe. It's not this absolute, oh my God, you have an opinion about me and it's just absolute. It just hits me like a like a hammer, you know, to the face. Boom, oh my God, you don't like me. And it's just, it feels like solid and intimidating. Yeah. Whereas if I have an experience of, well, other people have opinions and, and ideas and so on, but these things are malleable. They're like more, they're like softer. So it's more like a pillow to the face. If you don't like me, and it might still hurt a little bit to, to learn, oh, this person doesn't like me. Oh, that's that's on. That's, I, I'd rather have them like me, obviously. Yeah. But it feels more like a pillow to the face, where we can be like, let's let's work on this. Let's see what happens, you know. Rather than a hammer. Yeah. And it sounds to me like a, becoming more comfortable with confrontation. Yeah. And this this makes me think of. I say if I have a client who comes to me and is just feeling pretty low energy and pretty depressed and we work together for a bit and then it's common that we then find um, anger can arise mm. and it's like, oh no, I, I shouldn't be angry. And it's like, right, let's reframe that because previous prior to this, there was no anger. It was just, just this general low energy feeling. Um, but anger's coming up now, which means there's a part of you that's saying I don't deserve whatever's happening here. And that is the the budding of self-worth, mm -hmm. right? Because a, a person who believes that they don't, they truly believe they don't deserve anything good to happen to them, won't get angry if bad things happen. They'll just, they'll take it and it's like, oh, there's another, oh, there's yeah. another punch, yeah. oh. And then just be like, <laughs> you know, when someone who's angry, it's like, no, actually I deserve better than this. Yeah. So the, the, the way of reframing anger in that sense kind of, kind of helps. And yes, it sounds like it's just a case of healthy dis disagreements and sharpening that part of you that can confront something so that you, you develop that core. Mm -hmm. Which is, and this is, by the way, something I also want to do on the team at some point, uh, because I think it's a useful exercise actually to do anyway, to learn how to debate and to learn the dirty tricks of debating uh, so that you can recognize them and to... Because it's also something where I think that the better you get at debating, the the more you can see, you can kind of see it with a bit of a, a bit of distance, and you can see it when someone's playing games. You don't take it as seriously, and I think it's just a really good skill. It's a good skill to sharpen, you know. But it also goes in that direction where you can practice disagreeing with someone, standing up for an opinion. And in fact, one of the things you can do is you can practice arguing for a point you don't even believe in. So then you're even more dis, uh, even less attached to this, right? <clears throat> and I think that can you so you can build through practice, um, yeah, exposure to healthy disagreements, and you're also sharpening an argumentation and debate skill, which I think is useful. And this is actually one of those things. You know, I hope that at some point in the future we can model this with the Acario team, and we can show how we do it. But this is one of the things. You know, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you've heard us talk about the idea of building a tribe, the idea of finding and surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded, who are growth-minded, who who want to work together with you or just spend time together to, to get better as a group, essentially. And there's great power in this kind of community. There's great power in a community of people who uplift 
each other. And this is this is one of those things, you know, if you already have a community of people, even if it's just like two or three people who are on board with this kind of thing, we say, look, we want to we want to learn, we want to improve ourselves, we want to become badasses. This is one of the things you can do is like, hey, let's practice this. I need some exposure to healthy disagreement. Let's have an argument about something. Let's or let's do this for a couple of weeks, maybe once a week. You know, we we debate something. And let's see what happens. And that's one of the ways in which I can approach this. And this is one of the reasons why we advocate building a tribe. Because on your own, if, if this is a problem you struggle with, you need other people's approval desperately. Trying to solve that on your own is very difficult. Like trying to solve any kind of social thing in isolation is very difficult. Yeah. By having a tribe of people around you, it's like you give yourself the opportunity to to work on this and to practice this kind of thing. Yeah. It's like if certain beliefs and certain life scripts formed in the presence of other people, you know, like you believe you're not interesting, you believe you're not attractive, you do, you believe you're not you you're like you're weird or something. If that belief formed in a social setting, mm -hmm. there's only so much benefit you're going to get from just sort of sitting and writing about this or meditating about this that belief needs to be challenged yeah it needs to be challenged through direct experience so if you so, so as you say you you hang out around a bunch of people and you have these life scripts directly challenged through direct experience consistently then they they'll have to adapt and yeah. change yeah which which reminds me like one one more thing i would mention as a as a practice right, to, to, to work on this problem, to overcome this and outgrow it, is to start paying close attention to, um, to signals on both sides. And what I mean by this is most of us pay, pay very close attention to negative signals. So if someone doesn't like me, I notice and it's, I feel it physically, you know, I have a strong response to it, it's painful. But if someone equally signals to me that they like me, I might not even realize. And there's also something about even if someone like, even if explicitly someone comes up to me and says, I don't like you versus I like you. But if it's I don't like you, I I take that in. I believe you 100% and I take it in. It's like, oh my God, someone doesn't like me, right? If someone comes up to me and says, I like you, there's a part of me that's like, that goes, ah, you know, how many of us do that? When, when someone pays you a compliment, you kind of wave it off, right? Yes. You, you don't say thank <laughs> you for saying a nice thing about me. You know, someone says, oh, you know, you did that really well. And it's like, ah, I just got lucky. You know, it's almost like you, you're not letting the compliment in. Mm. So someone gives you positive signals to say, hey, I like you, I admire you and so on. It's like you're not letting them in. You're like waving them off. It's almost like you're fending off. <laughs> the positive signals from other people whacking them away as they yeah. come in no yeah i mean how many people do that I, I this is one of the things i have a tendency to do but i try to i try to not do <laughs> you know i try to deliberately not do that and i see a lot of people doing that and this creates this just reinforces your belief so if you believe that you are or you're afraid of of not being likable and you're paying so much attention to negative signals and you're just waving off positive signals. Well, that that doesn't put you in a, in a winning situation, does it? What if you start paying very close attention to both kinds of signals and you really let it in? You say, okay, this person likes me and mm -hmm. I accept that and I believe them. And But equally, and someone doesn't like me and I accept that and I believe them too and it's fine. But I, I want to build a more realistic picture of what's going on in my life. Yes. Yeah. And it relates to one question I like to ask people who are, they, they often give more power to negative thoughts than, than the positive ones, which is most of us. But one question I like to ask a person to sort of challenge that is, is there a part of you that can be just as open to the positive as the negative? Alternatively, is it as likely that a person could like you and dislike you? Is it at least as likely that a person could like you or dislike you? And oftentimes we'll be like, no, they've got, they've got to always dislike me. It's like, okay, well, let's examine that assumption. Yeah. Why? Well, because, and then the, the, the closer you get, the more you sort of examine these assumptions and you ask them, is it true? 
the more you can just tell that they just seem to have this like attachment to this negative self-image. Mm. And the longer you've had that negative self-image, the more you're probably attached to it because it's familiar. You know, that's the, that's the curious yeah, yeah. thing about this. It's like, it it's negative. It's having the consequences in your life are not what you'd choose. But accepting compliments and receiving them is unfamiliar. That's why we bat them away. Like, mm. I don't like that. Mm. Yeah, um, you can be you can be comfortable in your misery in a way. Yeah. You can, mm. I think I, you can. I I was. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can you can do that. There's, there's something else I wanted to mention um, when it comes to this because I think it could be quite useful. Is is the the use of role models? Mm. So we seem to this is something I've observed is a lot of people re- seem to respect a person who just like. He doesn't, he doesn't give a shit. He just says what's on his mind. He just says, does, does his own thing, whatever. We seem to respect, like a lot of people seem to respect that trait. Mm-hmm. And in my process for overcoming this, because I used to, I, I used to, I still kind of do. I'm still kind of processing this still. But I used to, this, this used to be way more of a problem than it is now. And I noticed that the things, the, the people I would wish I was a bit more like all had similar traits. Um, so Bill Burr, the comedian, who got, in, got on his, regularly gets on stage and just offends everyone, mm-hmm. and he's just like, ah, just laughing his ass off. <laughs> and also Robert Baratheon in Game of Thrones. <laughs> I don't want to be just like that guy. He's like dysfunctional in countless ways. But yeah. the point is, he's just this like, yeah, I want to hit somebody. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's just this person. It's like he clearly he has a lot of problems, but one of them is not giving a shit. Yeah, you know, one of them isn't giving too much of a shit what people think about him. Yeah, so it's just it, yeah, it's just the role model thing. It's it's interesting. Like find someone who, I mean, and this is the same for any behavior change. Really, it's find a, a role model who emulates this kind of behavior that you want to embody. Yeah, you can ask yourself, what would Robert Baratheon do? <laughs> Probably swing a hammer at it, <laughs> drink loads of wine. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, that's true. If you think about how successful the book The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck is, hugely successful, and how much we admire characters like that. And also, you know, what comes to mind, like the two really extreme examples of this archetype, if we can call it that, would be Rick from Rick and Morty. Mm. So extreme, right? It's just such extreme not giving a fuck. (laughs) And Archer from Archer. He's also like that where that's that's the amazing thing about him is how he just is unbelievably unshakable <laughs> he's getting shot at yeah and he's just sat behind a barricade doing an impression of some 80s action hero or something <laughs> yeah. and he's trying to get it right so that yeah. wasn't it that wasn't yeah. it it's bullets correct. flying overhead like, <laughs> yeah. no no let, let me do it again like, stop it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so there's clearly something there that we that we admire right and there's clearly to me that's also a signal especially like if you think about the subtle art of not giving a fuck by mark manson that book I think it clearly taps into something where a lot of people are like, I, I wish I could give less of a fuck. I wish I could be less affected. And yeah, so I hope that we, like you you know, you know, mentioned before we started recording, that this is a deep well of a topic. And so um, I hope that this is a good start, let's say, right, for anyone who's struggling with this. Here, you know, you hopefully picked up a couple of things to try, a couple of tools here that you can start trying and see what happens. And, you know, as to call back to, I think, the very first episode, it's like treat it as an experiment, right? The, the best way to approach this is not to think what is the perfect solution here, but just try stuff out. Treat it as an experiment, see what happens. So, and what would be really interesting to hear is to hear people's experiences, right? To hear, you know, if you have this struggle, tell us about it. And if you've overcome this struggle, if you have gone from a place of caring too much about what other people think to to a place where you have a healthier relationship with that we'd love to hear you know what your story is so leave us a voice message you can go to anchor.fm forward slash ikario to leave a voice message or go to the show notes or leave a comment or something like that we'd love to hear from you take care guys i think that's everything that's all all right and see you next time see you next time